Okay, so today we're looking at um, World War II. And I'm going to break World War II up into three videos. So this first video is on um, what the College Board says is Topic 7. Um, 11, which is interwar foreign policy. But as we look at World War II, we're going to be looking at the years right here of 1920 to 1945. And the emphasis is um, foreign policy. So when we're looking at interwar foreign policy, we uh, one of the things you want to focus on as you learn about this is you want to be comparing uh, this build-up and this lead-up to World War II to World War I. That's a very common task that students are asked to do is to compare uh, how the United States became involved in World War I to how the United States became involved in World War II. So what we're looking for when we say interwar, this uh, heading right here, when we're talking about the interwar foreign policy or interwar period, we're talking about the period between World War I and World War II. So the Roaring Twenties and the Dirty Thirties. Okay, some big historic developments that you want to focus on as, uh, as I walk you through these events. Um, there's two of them. The first one is that in the years following World War I, the United States pursued a unilateral foreign policy. And unilateral means one-sided. So the U.S. foreign policy is very, very focused on what will benefit the United States and not focused on being a good team player in the world. So in the years following World War I, the United States pursued a unilateral foreign policy. They used international investment peace treaties, and select military intervention to promote a vision of international order, even while maintaining U.S. isolationism. So following World War I, the United States um, is negotiating with many countries, is creating treaties with many countries, but underlying all of it is this commitment to uh, U.S. isolationism or U.S. non-intervention in the world. Okay, the second historical development is that in the 1930s, while many Americans are concerned about the rise of fascism and totalitarianism in Europe and Asia, most Americans oppose taking military action against the aggression of Nazi Germany and Japan until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. So the United States joins the war or declares war after the attack on Pearl Harbor in World War II. Prior to that, the majority of Americans did not want to get involved in this war. Okay, so before we jump into World War II, just a quick review on World War I. Right? If we remember in World War I, it was supposed to be a war to end all wars. So through the peace process of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, the problems that caused World War I were going to the vision or the goal was for those problems to be solved. Um, it was also supposed to make a world of uh, make the world safer for democracy, right? It's supposed to be a war that um, where empires and dictatorships and monarchies are replaced with democratic uh, governments. Um, following World War One, if you remember, President Woodrow Wilson was the lead architect of the Treaty of Versailles, and the most important part of the Treaty of Versailles for him was the League of Nations. And through, uh, through the negotiations in that treaty, the United States compromised, or Wilson compromised, many of his points away um, so that the League of Nations would be included in the Treaty of Versailles. But ultimately, the United States did not join the, the uh, League of Nations. And as we go through these events here, what we're going to see is that by 1933, it's clear that the League of Nations will not be able to maintain peace as Wilson envisioned. So as we go through this, I like to think of World War II as World War I Part Two, because a lot of the same problems that caused World War I are in place for World War II. So we want to start with a quick look at what foreign policy was in the United States following World War I. So in the early 1920s, in 1921, there's a big naval conference in Washington, D.C. This is called the Washington Naval Conference, and it's all about disarmament. So the idea is 
Um, the nations that are attending are voluntarily agreeing to disarm or reduce the amount of military machinery. And a lot of this focuses on naval power in the world. So there are three three treaties that are somewhat important that come out of this Washington Naval Conference. So the first one is the Five Power Treaty, which limits naval power. And it's a five power treaty because there's four, or sorry, there's five countries involved in this five power treaty. Uh, what did the nations involved in this five power treaty agree to is that they will limit the amount of uh, naval power they have. So they'll limit the number of destroyers, they'll limit the number of aircraft carriers they have. And they put in place ratios, which um, it was a five, five, three, one point six seven, one point six seven. So um, the U.S. and Great Britain could have five ships, Japan could have three ships, and Italy could have 1.67 ships. So there were ratios for how powerful um, these navies could be in the world. And this was to eliminate um, an arms race or unchecked building of navies around the world. So these ratios were supposed to maintain um, kind of the power or the status quo. One thing this five power treaty did though is that it it recognized the legitimacy of Japan as an imperial nation. So Japan didn't have the highest ratio. Um, it was five five and then Japan had three um, three ships to every five ships the US or Britain had, but it did recognize that uh, Japan is an industrialized um, naval power. So this five power treaty, while it's a disarmament treaty, it did acknowledge the power of Japan. Okay, there's also the four power treaty in which the US, Great Britain, France, and Japan promised to respect one another's territory in the Pacific. And then the nine power treaty, where all nine nations that were present at this conference promised to abide by the open door policy in China, which means, um, Nobody is going to try to uh, invade and take over China. That's what that nine power treaty essentially is. It's saying everybody's going to have trading access and nobody's going to try to militarily take over China. Um, all of these treaties at this Washington Naval Conference were accomplished outside of the League of Nations. And they are often held up as an example of successful disarmament when we look at foreign policy. So we want to be aware that these are these are there, that these agreements were made in the early 1920s and they're operating in the background. Um, these treaties will not be renewed in the early 1930s. So through the 1920s, uh, these treaties are in place and they do help keep territorial aggression and fighting between major military powers in the world in check. Okay, other things going on in the world in the 1920s are the war debts and reparations that were um, assessed on Germany after World War I. So if we look at this slide here that I cut in, this is a copy of a slide we looked at when we were looking at World War I. And on the left side of the slide, these are the goals that Woodrow Wilson had for the Treaty of Versailles. And then on the right side, we have the actual terms that were put into the Treaty of Versailles. And the one that's significant for us as we look at the um, buildup to World War II is the fact that Germany was disarmed and forced to pay reparations. They were forced to accept uh, guilt in World War I or responsibility for World War I. So they had to disarm or reduce their military power. And as a nation, they're forced to pay reparations of $53 billion. So this is, uh, this is pretty significant. It's coming out of World War I. Uh, Germany is weakened significantly. And this, this uh, request for Germany to pay these reparations was really put in place mostly by France, which shares a border with Germany. So the fear was that um, Europe was going to become destabilized again. If Germany was unable to pay those reparations, France was threatening to go in and to take land from Germany instead of the money. Um, and the fear was that if France did that, uh, Europe would again erupt into war. So U.S. bankers and politicians came up with a plan, and this is called the Dawes Plan. Um, the Dawes Plan is 
not the same as the Dawes Severalty Act in 1887, where um, the U.S. government was allocating land to Native Americans. But this Dawes plan in World War I was a plan to help stabilize Germany so that France would not try to retaliate against Germany in the 1920s. So the plan basically was that U.S. banks would give money, loan money to Germany. So U.S. banks is, were loaning about $2.5 billion to Germany through the first five years of the 1920s or so. And then Germany was going to take that money and pay most of it back to the Allies, so France and Great Britain, um, to make those reparation payments. Um, and then the Allies would take that money and they were paying back um, money they owed to the United States because they borrowed money to um, to buy war machinery or war goods from the United States before the U.S. joined World War I. So what we see here in this graphic with these triangles is basically just a shifting of debt. So the U.S. Um, was taking on Germany's debt. U.S. banks were taking on uh, Germany's debt um, and guaranteeing that debt to maintain stability in Europe. This works okay until the U.S. banking sector collapses in the late 1920s. So this Dawes plan is in some ways central to the Great Depression in the United States and the collapse of the U.S. banking system becoming a global depression in the 1930s. So it's important to understand this Dawes plan and what was happening. Okay, so the effects of this, basically, short term, are that Germany benefits, right? The German economy is stabilized and Germany benefits. Um, but it does make the German economy dependent on foreign markets. Um, and so when there were, like I said, when there were problems with those foreign markets, it's going to severely hurt Germany. Um, once Germany is severely hurt economically, the people will become desperate and they will throw their support behind leaders who promise easy and fast solutions to the depression. Um, and so we can see kind of where this is going. The rise of dictators like Adolf Hitler are in many ways tied to the economic collapse that happened in the 1930s. When the Great Depression first began, um, the U.S. continued to try and U.S. banks tried to collect on those debts from the Dawes plan. But by 1931, President Hoover proposes a moratorium on World War I debts, but the damage has already been done. The German economy has already crashed. Okay, and what we're talking about when we're, look, when we're looking at Germany, I just want you to get an idea of world history here. Um, when we're looking at German territory, after World War I, this map helps us see what, what was kind of going on for Germany. So this, uh, this purple area on the map, this is land that did belong to Germany prior to World War I, but is lost after World War I in the Treaty of Versailles. And then we can see the Rhineland, which is this yellow and um, pink stripe. This Rhineland area, that's the demilitarized zone between France and Germany. So Germany was not allowed to militarize in this area. Um, this Alsace-Lorraine region right here is a region that's known for coal. In fact, it's about it's responsible for about 40% of Germany's coal production in the early 1920s. So losing this territory was um, economically catastrophic for Germany. Um, and this is where France is, you know, France had gained this territory and then France was waiting, was going to take over this Rhineland territory if Germany didn't pay the debts. Um, so understanding this map is pretty important because as we start to talk about uh, Nazi Germany and Adolf Hitler, what we're going to see is that he works to rebuild this German empire. So he's going to be working to gain back this territory. So he's going to be moving troops into the Rhineland. He's going to be taking over these territories that were taken. Um, and he'll be trying to extend his influence and rebuild the German empire. Okay, in other places in the world in the 1920s, uh, the U.S. is really focusing on business. So um, U.S. foreign policy and business policy are very closely linked. So we see in Latin America that imperialism declines. The U.S. does not try to take over territories anymore. 
but the U.S. will be doubling their investments in that region from 1919 to 1929. So the U.S. is trying to um, make a profit off of its neighbors in Latin America. And the same is happening in the Middle East, because with the rise of the automobile, it's becoming very apparent that crude oil is a valuable commodity. So the United States government is working in the Middle East to secure drilling rights in areas of the Middle East in the 1920s. And then in terms of tariffs during the 1920s, the U.S. is putting in place protectionist policies. So the tariffs of the 1920s are all about protecting U.S. manufacturers. So in 1922, we have the Ford and McCumber tariff, which was about a 38 percent tariff rate. Um, and then in the as the Great Depression begins in 1930, to try to protect um, U.S. manufacturers during the Depression, the Holly Smoot tariff was passed, which is about a 60% tariff rate. Uh, the Holly Smoot tariff sh nearly shut down all global trade um, in 1930. So, in a time, again, if you watch the video on the Great Depression, in a time when the world needed free trade and free flow of money and goods, this tariff was shutting that down. Okay, so that takes us through the the 1920s, or at least the highlights of what we need to know in the 1920s. So the U.S. is really just worrying about itself. Okay, so as we move into the 1930s, um, we're going to see that the world is moving towards World War II. Uh, so what we're going to see for the United States is as, as World War II develops, the U.S. is going to begin with an attitude of disengagement, meaning they don't want to get involved, and then move to neutrality saying uh, we're going to remain neutral, we're not taking a side, to total involvement, where the United States is an active participant and total activation of the U.S. economy and home front to fight this war. So we want to follow, trace the, uh, the development of this from disengagement, like not even paying attention, to paying attention but remaining neutral to total involvement. Okay, so this is Roosevelt, right? FDR or Roosevelt is the president that's most impactful as we lead up to World War II. So he's the Great Depression president. He's also the World War II president. So as Roosevelt took office, you know, this is when he's passing his his Great New Deal programs. Um, it's right after his first 100 days. But in the summer of 1933, Roosevelt goes to an economic conference in London. And this conference was meant to help nations cooperate on strategies for the Great Depression. So they're talking maybe about lowering tariffs and finding ways to increase trade. As Roosevelt sits in this conference, he decides that uh, many of the ideas being discussed in this conference are actually going to hurt the U.S. economy. So Roosevelt withdraws from the London Economic Conference and he goes home. Um, the European nations fight, nothing really good comes out of this conference per se. Um, and what we see is that following this London Economic Conference, there's a surge of nationalism among European countries. So we're starting to see the competition between Euro European countries come back that we saw at the beginning of World War I. Um, John Maynard Keynes, when he was talking about Roosevelt's decision to leave, calls um, his decision magnificently right. Um, but after this London Economic Conference in 1934, many countries do agree to a reciprocal tariff reduction, which basically means for um, the countries will reduce their tariffs by the same amount. So if the U.S. reduces its tariff by 10 percent, Great Britain will reduce their tariff by 10 percent. So they agree to a reciprocal tariff reduction in an attempt to try to get world trade jump started again. Okay, if we're looking at FDR's actions in Latin America, um, largely what Roosevelt finds out during the Great Depression is that imperialism is very expensive. And so he, in different regions of the world where the U.S. had been imperialistic prior, he begins to pull back. So in Latin America, um, he attends the Pan American conferences and in 1933 promises to never intervene in internal affairs in Latin America again. Um, this promise is great. It's really a promise the U.S. couldn't do anything else because the U.S. didn't have any money and so economic intervention wasn't really even possible 
during this time anyway. If we look at Cuba as an example, Roosevelt nullifies the Platt Amendment, which was an amendment that the United States Congress added to Cuba's uh, constitution at the end of the Spanish-American War. It was the one that said um, all foreign policy decisions by Cuba needed to be subject to U.S. approval. So Roosevelt nullifies this Platt Amendment and retains only the U.S. right to Guantanamo Bay um, naval base. So we see in Latin America a reduction of imperialism by uh, Roosevelt. And then if we're looking at other places in the world, Roosevelt decides to recognize the Soviet Union, even though it was a communist nation. This is something the Republican presidents of the 1920s had not done. But his idea was, let's try and boost trade in the economy. So remember, this is the worst year of the Great Depression. So he doesn't worry about Soviet Union being a communist nation. He decides, let's try and increase trade. He also made moves in the Philippines. He persuaded Congress to um, allow for the independence of the Philippines. So um, he, he pushes Congress to pass a law that says the Philippines, by 1946, uh, will be independent, and the United States will gradually remove their military from the Philippines. Um, this actually does happen, but it's because... Uh, in 1941, Japan um, occupies the Philippines and takes the Philippines from the United States. And then at the end of World War II, the U.S. acquires the Philippines back and then uh, gives independence to the Philippines after World War II. Okay, so during this interwar period, um, we see in other nations... Um, dictatorships rising. So in 1922 in Italy, this man right here on the top right, Benito Mussolini, he leads um, Italy's fascist party. And um, Italy feels mistreated after um, World War I. They feel like they weren't given their due uh, for their contribution to the war. So Mussolini attracts as his followers or his supporters dissatisfied war veterans or those who are very nationalistic and those who are afraid of communism. Um, and he would he would sit in windows um, and of a building and give speeches out onto the street and speak to his followers. And um, his followers were the black shirts, right? So and then in Germany we start to see the rise of the Nazi party, which is a gradual process in Germany. Um, we don't have time to go through all the details. It's very interesting. But um, in the 1920s, uh, there's a strong resentment of the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, many people feel like Germany was treated very badly, um, that the economic conditions in Germany are bad because of the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, and they begin to support the National Socialist Party or the Nazi Party. Um, and over time, Adolf Hitler rises to prominence within this party. Um, so it begins in the 1920s. By 1933, Hitler's gained control of the Nazi Party and the German government. So we have these two. They're going to become... Um, and call themselves the Axis powers, and it's the Rome-Berlin Axis. So if you look at a map of Europe, those two cities are pretty close to north and south of each other. So they're an axis, or there's a line between the two. Um, so they'll become the Axis powers. And then in Japan, um, Japan's a little bit different. Um, Japan is more nationalistic and militaristic. Um, and in the 1920s and 1930s, Japan is trying to assert its power as a regional power in Southeast Asia. Japan wants to be the regional power in Southeast Asia. Um, and again, as economic conditions worsen in the 1930s, that's going to open a door for military dictators to gain control in the Japanese government. So here we have Emperor Hirohito who by birth is emperor of Japan, and then General Hideki Tojo, who is a military uh, general and a politician who's able to gain control of Japan's government. And between the two of them, um, they are the military leaders or the dictatorial leaders of Japan. 
Um, one of the things that Japan is really seeking in this time period is access to raw materials. Uh, Japan is a small island nation. They don't have enough um, mineral resources or oil, things like that, for an industrializing nation. So they began imperializing and looking to territories um, outside of mainland of um, the island of Japan. Okay, so we can kind of see right here with this map, and we're going to be looking at this map a few times, but this green area is Japan in the 1930s, right? So we have um, what we know as Japan right here, this I, these chains of islands, and then Japan also controlled the Korean Peninsula um, in 1930. And we'll see that there's just a, a progression or steps of invasions of neighbors. So Japan will invade Manchuria in 1930. Um, that's our, that was a region of China. Um, and then uh, mainland China in 1937. But what's interesting about this invasion of Manchuria in 1930 is that according to the Nine Power Treaty, Japan had promised not to invade China. Right? The Nine Power Treaty said nobody was going to invade China. So Japan went ahead and they invaded China, uh, Manchuria. And the League of Nations, which Japan was a member of, was powerless to do anything about this. Um, so we'll we'll take a look. But when when Japan invades Manchuria and when these dictators are rising in Europe, the question is how does the U.S. respond to this? And this is one of our big kind of takeaways, um, or one of the historical developments that we need to know. That many Americans were concerned, but um, they opposed taking military action. So kind of at the root of this is the question of when is it appropriate to ask American citizens to possibly sacrifice their lives to stop something from happening in another nation? And so in the early 1930s, most people oppose taking military action. Um, and it's not until, again, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor that the American people are going to feel like taking action. So we have a few political cartoons that go along with this. This one's one of my favorites. Um, and because your your APUSH exam is going to be a DBQ only this year, it's pretty important to take a look at how would I um, or how would you approach uh, primary documents. So this here is a cartoon from the early 1930s that was in U.S. newspapers. And we see a U.S. ship with the United States um, and floating in the water are um, icebergs that could possibly sink this ship, right? So foreign treaties, foreign entanglements, treaties with France and England, the League of Nations. So the United States determines we're gonna go it alone. And if we're looking at the um, caption on this cartoon, it says better to keep to the old channel. Um, and that kind of brings up the ideas of George Washington, better to keep to the old ways of isolation and not getting entangled in European affairs. Okay, um, other cartoons of the time. I don't know if you uh, recognize the artist of this cartoon, but this is a Dr. Seuss political cartoon from the 1930s. Um, and it makes me laugh because it looks just like the books we read when we were kids, right? You can definitely see that it's a Dr. Seuss. You don't even have to read the bottom or the signature to know that it's Dr. Seuss. Um, but he's also saying, you know, what a lucky thing. We've got separate beds. The United States is physically removed from Europe, and you can see all of the people of Europe are uh, sick with different kinds of diseases like Hitleritis and Blitzpox and fascist fever. Um, so this is one of those cartoons that shows the American people are pretty happy to be not involved in this. Okay, and then another where we see the Atlantic Ocean and Uncle Sam turns his back on Europe and says, it ain't what it used to be. Um, but one thing that's interesting about the second cartoon is that the Atlantic Ocean is not very wide. So it's showing that Europe and, and the affairs of Europe are closer to the United States than they used to be. Um, so the United States in the 1800s, much easier to be um, uninvolved in European affairs. But by the 20th century, there's a global society. So 1930s, 1940s, um, whether the United States wants to be or not, they end up involved in world affairs. Okay, so by 1935, 
major problems are starting to be visible in the politics of Europe. So we want to look at prelude to the war in Europe. So what's happening in Europe 1935 to 1938? Um, so there's a term, appeasement. Um, so in uh, between these years, there's a series of moves by European powers where they attempt to take over their neighbors. So in 1935, um, Italian troops take over Ethiopia. Um, by, in 1936, the Rhineland, which had been permanently demilitarized by the Treaty of Versailles, was remilitarized by Germany. So Germany moves troops back into the Rhineland in 1936. In 1937, Japan invades China, again looking for more raw, raw materials or resources. And in 1938, uh, Germany takes over an area of Czechoslovakia called the Sudetenland, which was an area um, where there were a lot of ethnic Germans living. So um, the Nazi government by 1938 says these ethnic Germans belong to, um, to our empire. Okay, the, uh, the European response, let me take that off of there real quick. The European response to all of this is called appeasement. So each time these nations did this, European leaders would basically say, okay, fine, you know, you did this, you took Ethiopia, don't do it again. Um, as, as the German government would take over land, they'd say, okay, but don't, but don't take any more, you're done now. And they'd get a promise um, to, that these governments wouldn't take any more, wouldn't invade any other neighbors. But they continue to do so. And so this is called appeasement. And many people point to this as a failure in foreign policy leading up to World War II. Um, if you look at the flip side of this, the other choices besides appeasement would be to use force. So um, these European leaders are looking at, at these situations saying, well, we don't want to go to war yet. So just don't do it anymore. Um, but appeasement didn't work because um, successively these European dictators would take more land and more land. The U.S. response to all of this, in 1937, um, Roosevelt gives a speech called his quarantine speech. And Roosevelt says the major powers of the world need to quarantine these fascist powers. They need to surround them and quarantine them and not allow them to take any more land. But the public opinion to this quarantine speech was very negative. So Roosevelt backed off of the quarantine speech and begins to talk more about preparedness. He says, well, let's prepare just in case. Um, and he begins to talk more about preparedness than, um, than trying to actually stop this or quarantine this. So the, uh, the approach taken after the quarantine speech is U.S. neutrality. But at the same time, um, Roosevelt begins asking Congress for more money so that um, the, the U.S. government can pay for an arms buildup leading up to World War II. So in what we're looking at here, when we're looking at territories taken over, um, Ethiopia, if we're looking at Ethiopia, this is where Italy invades. And you can see Ethiopia is right by the Suez Canal. So this is a territory where it gives, uh, gives Italy a lot of power in terms of world trade and controlling the Suez Canal um, when Ethiopia can control, or when Italy can control Ethiopia. And then in Germany, we have the Rhineland that was remilitarized. The Sudetenland is this light green horseshoe around Czechoslovakia. And then Germany also um, invaded Austria, although this wasn't really an invasion. Uh, most Austrians met the German troops moving into Austria with open arms. Um, so Germany was basically piece by piece rebuilding its empire from before World War I. Okay, in um, Asia, what we see is with... Uh, Japan invading Manchuria, we see this violation of the open door policy. Um, it's a violation of the covenant of the League of Nations. So the League of Nations says to Japan, you promise not to do this. But the promise is, okay, it's also a violation of the nine power treaty. Um, the promise or the problem is mm, there's no enforcement policy for any of these treaties or agreements that Japan had made. 
Um, so there's not much that the League of Nations could do. But the U.S. decides here, the U.S. says they will no longer honor their treaty obligations under, under the Nine Power Treaty. So the U.S. will no longer respect the agreements they made to Japan under the Nine Power Treaty. So we start to see in 1930, there's a breakdown of relationships with Japan in the United States. Okay, um, and then that's just going to get successively worse as Japan invades other parts of, of Asia. Southeast Asia. Um, when Japan invaded Manchuria, the League of Nations, all they could do was issue like a, a written reprimand to Germany. So following that written reprimand in 1931, Japan withdraws from the League of Nations in 1933. So we can see that the League of Nations begins falling apart because it was so much centered on voluntary cooperation. And without the United States being a part of this League of Nations, there wasn't enough cohesion in the world with this League of Nations, so it wasn't powerful enough. One thing you want to watch for is the Soviet Union in 1930 or 1939. Um, we're going to be talking about why the Soviet Union was expelled from the League of Nations in 1939. The rest of the countries withdrew, but um, kind of watch for what happens with the Soviet Union. Okay, during all of this, the United States Congress passes a series of laws that says U.S. is going to be neutral. And again, this is a reflection of the will of the people. So in 1935, um, the first Neutrality Act was one that authorized the president to prohibit armed shipments and forbid U.S. citizens from traveling on belligerent nation ships. So this, if you think back to World War I, uh, the U.S. was... Um, kind of brought into or uh, drug into World War I because U.S. citizens were traveling on British passenger liners that were being um, torpedoed by German U-boats. So this one says the president can, pro can prohibit citizens from traveling on belligerent nation ships. So as nations go to war, um, this gave the authority for the president to prohibit. In 1936, it forbids loans and credits belligerent nations. So again, in World War I, the U.S. kind of got drawn into World War I because of its loans to um, really Great Britain, but the Allied side, right? So this one says we're not going to be giving out loans this time. Uh, so the U.S. won't get drawn in. And then in 1937, there's a neutrality act that forbids the shipment of arms to opposing sides in the civil war in Spain. And there's a civil war in Spain in 1937. Uh, Francisco Franco, a fascist uh, rebel, takes control of the Spanish government. So this is seen as a struggle between fascism and republicanism. And rather than get involved, the U.S. Congress says we need to stay out of this one. So they're not trying to get involved in saving democracy, for example, in 1937. So all of these are a reflection of the will of the people. They're concerned about what's happening in the world, but not concerned enough to commit to war. Okay, we're going to start seeing this change. Okay, so this will start to change. Uh, 1939 is when World War II actually begins in Europe. The U.S. won't get drawn in until 1941, but we're going to start to see attitudes change about... Um, the U.S. involvement. So, in 1939, um, this is the final move or the final territorial expansion of Germany that leads um, other European powers to declare war against Germany. So, in 1939, the Soviet Union, which is right here on this map, and Germany sign a non-aggression pact. So, what that means is they promise to not fight against one another. And they're going to split Poland down the middle. So they each invade Poland. They're going to split Poland down the middle and share it between the two of them. So the Soviet Union will get the eastern half of Poland. Uh, Germany will get the western half of Poland. And they agree not to fight with each other. Okay, this, what we see here is Germany's trying to avoid the situation that occurred with World War I, where Germany was surrounded and fighting a two-front war. So by, agree by making an agreement with the Soviet Union, um, Germany does not need to fight on the Eastern Front. They, um, so they invade Poland on September 1st, 
and France and Britain declare war against um, Poland in response. So we see the beginning of World War I in 1939 with the Allies, Britain and France on one side, the Axis powers, um, Germany, Italy, and then Japan is going to join the Axis in 1940. So uh, the beginning of the war, this, these are the sides of the war. Um, what's interesting is uh, many didn't see this coming, this non-aggression pact, because Germany and the Soviet Union uh, did not like one another, right? Fascism and communism um, are in opposition to one another. Uh, fascism or communism, sorry, communists are one of Hitler's four hates. Um, he preached against four hates and one of those was communism. So people didn't really see this, this happening, but here we have um, Hitler bowing to Stalin, right? And Hitler says to him, the scum of the earth, I believe. And Stalin responds, a bloody assassin of the workers, I presume. So this is a situation where the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Laying in between the two of them is a slain Poland. Okay, Germany, um, we basically have a period from September of 1939 to the spring of 1940 of waiting. These nations have declared war against each other, but no actions being taken. Um, this was called Sitzkrieg, or the sitting war. They're waiting for it to start. But in the spring of 1940, uh, Germany uses a strategy called Blitzkrieg, or a lightning war. Um, again, Germany's trying to avoid uh, the situation of World War I. So it's an overwhelming air attack, fast moving tanks on the ground. Um, and Germany moves quickly to invade their neighbors. Denmark and Norway surrender after a few days. And within a week, Germany has occupied most of France. So this picture here we see of Hitler in the front with many of his commanders around him in front of the Eiffel Tower. So they've controlled France um, in the spring of 1940. So we have Denmark and Germany, if you're looking at this map. What this does is it removes the ability of Great Britain to put in a blockade across the North Sea. So in World War I, Germany was blockaded and couldn't get through, um, couldn't get their supplies in and out through this North Sea. Um, so this time, by controlling Norway, uh, Britain has a much more difficult time putting a, a blockade across the North Sea. And then by controlling France, um, there's no place, no friendly place, for the Allies to launch their attack into Germany. Um, so it has to be a sea or air invasion um, from Great Britain to come and help their ally France. So in the spring of 1940, if we look at the situation in Europe, Britain is basically on its own against Germany and the Soviet Union um, has not joined into this war yet. So we see by the height of this war, if we're looking at this map right here, Germany really was able to control most of Europe, most of continental Europe. So we have the Allies, Allied held areas in green. So um, the United Kingdom and then the Soviet Union will join the side of the Allies because once once Germany is able to control continental Europe, um, Germany double crosses the Soviet Union and invades into the Soviet Union's territory in Poland. And that's going to lead the Soviet Union to declaring war against um, Germany. But Germany felt like in controlling most of continental Europe, that was a safe bet. They could afford to fight on this Eastern Front against the Soviet Union because the United Kingdom really wasn't able to launch a good attack into, uh, into continental Europe. Um, because they had no place to use as a base of attack. Okay, so we're gonna look at what's the US doing as all this is happening. Okay, so the US begins changing, um, changing its policy from neutrality um, to more involvement. So in 1939, there's a Neutrality Act passed. It's called the Neutrality Act of 1939, but it really is a law that helps Great Britain. It's called catch and carry. And basically what it means is that um, Britain can bring cash to pay for any arms um, or military supplies it needs. And as long as they carry it back across the Atlantic themselves, they can take it. So you show up on our coast with cash, you transport your own goods, 
and you can buy whatever you need. So it's kind of like one of those Craigslist ads where you you uh, show up, you transport, you can have it. So in 1939, we have cash and carry. In 1940, there's a Selective Service Act, and this is really significant because the U.S. is not at war yet. But in 1940, um, the Selective Service Act requires a registration of all U.S. men between the ages of 21 and 35. So this is the first peacetime draft in U.S. history. It's the first time that young men in the United States were required to register for the draft, even if the United States was not at war. And then Roosevelt also got Congress to agree to a program called Destroyers for Bases in 1940, where um, the U.S. would give 50 older but serviceable uh, naval destroyers to Britain in exchange for military bases. Um, so some of the territories and bases that the U.S. controls in the Caribbean came from this Destroyers for Bases program. So things are changing, right? So by 1940, the U.S. is getting involved. We have another cartoon by Dr. Seuss here, and we can see uh, the USS Neutrality Act is carrying goods, looks like war goods, aid to our allies, and it's circling the drain to war, basically, right? So that's what this says, is we are, we're taking aid to our allies, and we're essentially circling the drain to war. Um, another Dr. Seuss, right? U.S. aid to Britain, Rush aid. Um, across the Atlantic. Okay, um, this becomes an issue in the election of 1940. And this is interesting because this is, you know, Roosevelt FDR has served eight years, but Roosevelt decides to run for a third term. And his decision to do this had to do with the coming war. He felt like the war was coming. He was most aware of what was going on. And so he decided to run for a third term. And he's running against a man named Wendell Wilkie. And Wilkie criticized the New Deal, but Wilkie and Roosevelt were essentially the same on wartime preparedness. They said, you know, basically it's time for the U.S. to prepare just in case. So in this election of 1940, um, you can see FDR wins pretty soundly. FDR is the blue states. Um, Wilkie, the Republican, are the, is the red states. So FDR wins 54% of the vote. It's not as strong an election win as his 1936 or 1932 win, but the economy had made strong economic gains based on defense spending, and the American people chose experience over somebody new as it looked like the U.S. was going to enter into war. Okay, so following this election, Roosevelt feels empowered, and he gives a speech. Um, he gives a fireside chat in January of 1941 um, called the Four Freedoms speech. Um, and in this, he tells the American people, the United States needs to be the arsenal of democracy. So he says, basically, Britain is in trouble. Um, they're, they're the only line of defense for democracy in Europe. And so the United States needs to provide any goods that Britain needs in this fight. Um, so the U.S. is going to become the arsenal of democracy. And Roosevelt says we must stand behind these four freedoms, the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Um, so these, these kinds of speeches are significant because they're bringing the American public around from neutrality to acceptance of the war. Okay, in March of 1941, the U.S. goes further. Um, and the U.S. passes a new law that replaces the Cash and Carry Neutrality Act of 1939. Uh, this is the Lend-Lease Act. Uh, Britain at this point is starting to run out of money, but Great Britain still needs um, war goods. So what the Lend-Lease Act says is we will lend to you whatever you need and you can pay for it later. Right. So Roosevelt explains this to the American people using a fire hose analogy. He says, if your neighbor's house is on fire and you had a hose, would you be upset if your neighbor ran over and borrowed your hose? And he says, of course you wouldn't, because their house was on fire. Their house is more important than a fire hose. He says, would you be upset if your hose was destroyed? while your neighbor was putting out the fire. And you would say, of course you wouldn't, because you know your neighbor would replace your hose. And he says, this is what we're doing with Great Britain. We, uh, 
we're lending them the items they need, right? We're giving them the tools they need to win this war. If it gets destroyed, it's okay. They are our allies. We know they, were pay, they will pay us back. So the Lend-Lease Act in 1941, um, basically the United States is manufacturing whatever's needed and Great Britain is acquiring it on credit. And the dates here are pretty important, right? This is March 1941. Pearl Harbor um, occurs in December of 1941. So as we move through these events right here, we're moving towards the United States involvement in World War II. Okay, there's a side benefit of the Lend-Lease Act. If we're looking at the side benefit, American businesses are getting extremely rich from um, from this Lend-Lease Act. So about 11.1 billion by the end of April 1943. So this is good for the American economy. This is the stimulus or the spending that pulls the United States completely out of the Great Depression. Okay, in the summer of 1941, Roosevelt, unbeknownst to many of the American people and many American politicians, he meets with um, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill um, on a ship in the Atlantic. <laughs> and they got together to discuss what their peacetime objectives were going to be. So they're already coming together, these two, the United States and Great Britain, and deciding what is a post-war world going to look like? Um, this is going to be significant as we get to the end of the war because notice um, Stalin is not here in this picture. And there will be numerous meetings between the leaders of the Allied nations. It's going to be FDR, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin. But there's a tension between Joseph Stalin and the other two. FDR is pretty good at navigating that tension. But when Roosevelt dies in 1945, his successor, uh, President Truman, Harry S. Truman, is not at good, as good at navigating the tension between Stalin. So during World War II, we have this reluctant alliance between the Soviet Union and Great Britain and the United States. And so this is kind of why this Atlantic Charter is important. Even before the U.S. has declared war, the U.S. is getting involved in how to negotiate and come up with what the peacetime world is going to look like. Okay, in July of 1941, um, there's an event that occurs in the Pacific. Uh, FDR orders U.S. naval vessels to escort British ships carrying lend-lease materials as far as Iceland. So, they are practicing a convoy system where United States ships are protecting British ships halfway or a little bit more than halfway across the Atlantic Ocean. On September 4th, there's a U.S. ship called the Greer that was attacked by a German submarine. So you should be thinking right now, this is sounding pretty sim similar to what was happening in World War I. And it absolutely is. Right. So the Greer is attacked by a German submarine. And in response, Roosevelt orders... Uh, the United States naval ships to attack all German ships on site. So by July of 1941, what we have is an undeclared naval war in the Atlantic between United States Navy and the German Navy. Um, and now what we're sitting at here is how is the United States going to get involved in the rest of this war? So um, this is where Japan comes in and we're looking at disputes with Japan um, because it was really the actions of Japan that draw the United States completely into World War II. So I mentioned that in 1940, Japan joins the Axis powers. Um, Japan sees an opportunity to try to advance their interest as the main regional power in Southeast Asia. So when Japan joins the Axis powers, Roosevelt responds by prohibiting the export of steel and scrap iron to all countries except for Britain and the Western Hemisphere. So basically what he's done here is we have a situation where Japan is looking for raw materials and, and metal. Basically, they need metal um, to be able to build industrialized machines and buildings and bridges and vehicles. And one of the sources of this metal was scrap um, scrap iron or scrap metal from the United States. So when uh, when Japan joins the Axis powers, Roosevelt realizes this. He cuts them off, and he's hoping to apply economic pressure to Japan. 
in response, <laughs> in response, Japan um, invades French into China. Um, and I'll show you a map of where this is, but French Indochina is Vietnam. So Japan invades French Indochina, and in response, FDR freezes all Japanese credits and cuts off all oil to Japan. Um, he realizes that if Japan is going to engage in war, oil is going to become an important resource. So he cuts off all oil to Japan, and the two nations come together to negotiate. Um, they met in the United States at the end of October of 19. Um, 1941, but the negotiations fail. These two countries fail. So if we look back at this map of Japan, we had Manchuria in 1930, mainland China um, between 31 and 33, and then the invasion of Indochina, this purple area in 1940. So Japan and the United States are at a standstill, and Japan makes the decision to attack the U.S. fleet. Now, this uh, this attack occurs in Hawaii at the Pearl Harbor uh, naval base, and this was not a complete surprise, right? There's a uh, conspiracy theory out there that Roosevelt knew that this attack was coming and chose not to respond because he wanted to be drawn into war, but um, that's not really true. Most of the command, most of the military command, and Roosevelt certainly knew that an attack was imminent, but they didn't know where that was going to occur. So they're thinking, is it going to be in the Philippines? Is it going to be in Guam? Where is Japan going to attack? The average American person, however, was stunned when this attack occurred. So um, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, December 7th of 1941. Their goal in this attack was to cripple the American fleet. They were hoping to gain a year. They were thinking if they could cripple the American fleet for one year, that would give Japan time to um, establish dominance and take over territory in Southeast Asia. Um, and the United States could not stop or block them. They underestimated, however, there were a few Air Force carriers that were out at sea and not at Pearl Harbor on the day of the attack. So those survived. Um, and they underestimated how quickly the U.S. economy could mobilize to rebuild. So Japan thought they would gain a year. All they gained was about mm, three and a half to four months before the United States was able to exceed the manufacturing of warships um, or exceed the level and replace. So three and a half months is what Japan bought. Uh, but in this attack in Pearl Harbor, um, on that day, there were 2,400 Americans killed, 1,200 wounded, 20 warships destroyed, 150 airplanes destroyed. So it was definitely um, a significant hit to the U.S. naval capacity, but it didn't cripple U.S. naval capacity like Japan thought. Um, we have quite a few pictures of Pearl Harbor. So on the day of attack, the attack came in a couple of waves. So early morning was the first attack, and then there were a few hours where uh, people were able to um, triage, and then a second wave of an attack came from, from the Japanese about six hours later. Um, so if we look, there's plenty of pictures, and if you look up Pearl Harbor, um, you can find quite a bit of information here. But following this attack, Roosevelt gave that speech, right? He went to Congress and he, he used those words. He said, this is a day that will live in infamy. And he asks the U.S. Congress for a declaration of war. Um, the U.S. Congress responds. And um, in December of 1941, the United States has officially entered World War II on the side of the Allies. So. This is the interwar period that we just went over. So if we're looking here, the two big historical developments you're taking is that in the years following World War I, the U.S. pursues a unilateral foreign policy um, to promote a vision of an international order, but is also practicing isolationism or non-involvement in world affairs. In the 1930s, as dictatorships rise, Americans are concerned, but it wasn't until the attack on Pearl Harbor that drew the United States into World War II. Uh, things that you would 
usually be asked about when we're looking at this interwar period are especially the neutrality acts. Um, so rewind if you need to. You want to know the progression of the United States from being disengaged to neutral to engaged. Um, so things like cash and carry and the Lend-Lease Act, you want to know that. You also want to know um, the Four Freedom Speech uh, because that gives the kind of purpose for what the American people thought they were fighting for. So um, the next video, I'm going to go over two topics. We're going to be looking at um, the home front or mobilization for the war, and we're also going to be looking at the military um, actions during World War II. So make sure, um, you know, take notes, take a look at this, and then make sure to come back for the next video. And then we'll have a third one on World War II on um, the post-war politics, which is really the beginning of the Cold War. So post-war diplomacy. Okay, email me if you have questions. I'd love to answer them.